Hi, I'm Aaron Katusa from KC Research, and I'm here with our friend Eric Sprott. Eric, I'm going to ask you the tough questions because that's what our subscribers want us to do. Now, the first one we've got many emails on is, you're a big silver bull, you're a big gold bull, you're a legend in the business, no questions there. But you did sell a significant amount of the silver trust. Yes. Why? Okay. Well, believe it or not, um, there are times, in fact, uh, even today, I'm selling silver to buy uh, precious metal stocks. I sold the silver trust to buy silver stocks. I'm selling shares in our company to buy gold and silver stocks. I'm, buy, I'm selling even some art that I have to buy gold and silver stocks. But I can guarantee you, I have never exited the precious metal square whatsoever. I've never been a net seller. I don't think I've sold in my life a bar of gold that I own. I haven't sold a bar of silver that I own. But as a portfolio manager, you have to figure out where you're going to get the best action for your money. So there'll be lots of times that we will reduce some sector. I think this is one of the great times, of course, where you the stocks are way more compelling than the um, than the underlying metal. Okay. Now, as a director of Copper Mountain in the past. I understand the, the, the difficulty of always when you're buying, you got to report, you're selling, you got to report, yeah. you've got issues with that. And perhaps in my case, I got fined on both the buy and the sell. It's a $50 fine because you have five days to report. And I got yeah. someone in the company to do it and yeah. they dodged it up. Yeah. Now you had a delay in your reporting of the sales. That I'm not aware of. And I guarantee you if there was some delay or some issue with it, I'm sure uh, whether it's the SEC or the OSC who love to re regulate firms like us would have said something to us. I don't think there was any delay in us filing any report, to be honest. Okay. I mean, we are so careful about that. I mean, we probably have 50 or 60 or 70 companies within our organization where we have to report every time a transaction takes place. So I think we have a pretty efficient compliance department in terms of putting that information when it's in, particularly where, you know, where the sponsor of the fund um, I, I don't, I mean, I've never received a slap on the wrist for that, so I, somebody suggests I'm late, I wouldn't, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Now, Sprott as an organization, you know, let's face it, you're, you've been in the business for over 40 years, you're getting towards your twilight years, what's the succession plan at Sprott? Is there one yet? Okay, okay. Well, as you know, um, We've hired uh, Peter Groskopf as our CEO. I think Peter's going to do it, has done, and will do an outstanding job. And I will concur, he's an excellent yeah. individual. And uh, as you, you know, you're a good friend of Rick Rule, who's worked with the KC Group, and um, he's leading our, our charge down in the US. But I think Rick brings a, a, a bit of worldliness to our firm, uh, where his name is well known around the world, and he's a stand-up guy, which is important. Uh, he says what he believes, which is important. I mean, I've always been a great believer that you have to stand up and say what you believe, and you know, you have to be way more right than wrong, and Rick's willing to stand in there, so I think uh, Rick's will be a very important cog in our company here. We have lots of other portfolio managers and different products now that we didn't have years ago, whether it's fixed income or um, balanced funds and things like that. I've always been kind of a precious metals guy in the last 13 years. I was a small cap guy before that. But we have lots of personnel who can uh, trade in those particular products now too. Now as the market is significantly correct, look, it's been a horrible place to be yeah. for the last two years. Yeah. We've seen the independent firms. You had like Canaccord merged yeah. with Genuity. Uh, who took over who there is a question. Yeah. Yes, or two days ago we saw GMP take over yeah. Uh, Macquarie, the Australians right. are bailing out of the right. Canadian markets. Yeah. Where's Sprott in the next five years? Are you a consolidator or are you going to be wrapped up? Okay. In terms of the, uh, well, well, I'm not sure ask, whether you're asking as a broker or as an asset manager. Asset manager. Okay. As an asset manager, uh, we will be an acquirer. You know, we, we've already, um, we're always looking for opportunities. I think um, the valuations have come down, so it's easier for us to do things. We have a lot of capital now. I think our capital is like 400 million or so. So we got a lot of capital. We have no debt. Uh, we have a lot of cash. So um, we'll be a, a significant a party in looking at anything that's out there that fits with our mandate. And it, it really has to fit with our mandate or, or be so complementary. Let's say it's some area that we're not in that we want to be in. And uh, we'll, we'll look at that. But Peter Groskopf is doing that and I know 
there's probably not a month goes by that I don't hear about some opportunity in the asset management business that Peter's investigating. Well, it'll help when your next two top guys write big checks. Yeah. You know, so that's a good thing to see. Yeah. So a disciplined balance sheet. Now, let's talk about the demographics of our resource sector. There's big problems, not just in the industry itself on the brokerage side or financial side, but also in the actual mining of the companies. You got yeah. a whole bunch of gray haired guys and there's about 20 years gap between there. Mm -hmm. From your management side, what are you looking at doing regarding the, you know, the demographic time bomb? Are you referring to in our company or in mining companies? Both. So how are you going to invest okay. in the sector and yeah. who's going to carry the torch moving yeah. forward? Well, I mean, we have lots of people who are with us now. You know, we have um, a, a separate uh, precious metals fund. Uh, I have uh, mining analysts working with me. We have people, Neil Asha down in, uh, in San Diego. Uh, so we got lots of talent that can replace. In fact, I sort of doubt my talents as a mining guy. I'm a chartered accountant, okay? And thank goodness we brought in more sort of geological ta talent, which, which Rick and Neil have. So I, I think we're kind of well placed to at least probably better analyze a, a precious metal stock today than we were five years ago. Perfect. But, but I would say this, you know, Marin, the, the most important thing in, in the precious metal business is the price of precious metals, okay? Because most of them, they're all going to go up if the price of precious metals goes up. And it's that fine little difference between, well, which is the one that's going to go up 500% uh, instead of 200%. And that, that's a critical thing. But you know, if the price of gold goes to 2400, I would bet the whole index goes up 200%. What we try to do, of course, is very, well, where's the one that can go up 1000%? That's what we're looking for. Now, you hit the nail on the head. You're, you're, are you still adamant that gold's going to go up to 2400 within the Absolutely. next 12 months? You know, the thing I can't fall away from, first of all, I believe the zero interest rates and printing of money is a Ponzi scheme. I mean, pure and simple, you're what? You're printing money. But can't well, the Ponzi scheme go a lot longer than logic well, can prevail? It can go longer, but it's still a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> it can go longer, yeah. But there'll be, like if it goes longer, there'll be some un other unintended consequence. Maybe there'll be hyperinflation or something, right? Which of course would feed back into gold and silver. But I just think that uh, we are so far down the line in terms of things that have gone wrong. And you know, they're, they're even questioning now the effectiveness of QE, whether it's one, two, or three. They had, once they were over, I mean, it just, the, the markets collapsed, and it'll probably, the same thing will happen here. So the markets are addicted to financial heroin. The markets are being supported, and I use the word supported by financial heroin. And the minute you withdraw that, of course, there's going to be huge consequences. We've already seen a huge consequence in the bond market here where interest rates are shot up. And when that feeds through in the economy, which will have a huge negative effect on housing, it's going to have a negative effect on auto sales ultimately because all these companies were able to give zero financing. Well, now you know what? It costs money to borrow money. So they can't give zero financing anymore. So, no, I, I'm, uh, I haven't believed in the, in the system and I believe that, yes, the gold price can move up dramatically. And, and within all of that, that framework, well, what are we doing? We have this crazy system. Then you look at the demand for gold, the physical demand for gold, and you see numbers that are just staggering. I, I mean, I cannot hardly believe when you see some min statistics up 70, 60, 82, whatever. Chinese imports up 57. I mean, huge numbers, okay? Gold production probably won't even be up this year will not be up. Here's a question. I have a problem sitting in a conference room and listening to someone, especially the GATA guys, talking about gold manipulation and <laughs> silver manipulation. Yeah. Do you believe that the gold price is being manipulated by yeah. these smart bankers at Goldman Sachs or whoever in New York or wherever? For sure, for sure Marin, I believe it's manipulated. For sure I think that. And here's why I think it. Um, I believe the demand for gold today is probably 50% above the supply. 50%, so I keep saying, and I look at the physical, how can all these people be buying all this gold? Ask yourself, how can China, in a two year period, come in and buy 25% of the gold market, which they now buy, 20, no, sorry, 25% more of the gold market in the last two years? And in that two years, the price of gold went down. What are about 25% more of the oil market, or the wheat market, or the corn market? Like, how does a guy come in and buy 25% more of something, and the price goes down? And how do you come in and buy 25% more when the production never went up? 
And that's, when I look at all the analysis of uh, supply and demand for gold, I see these buyers coming in, but no increase in supply. Supply really hasn't changed in 13 years. So I have to ask myself, where's the gold coming from? And in terms of manipulation, I think what happens is the central bank can lease their gold. So they lease it to JP Morgan because somebody in Asia wants to buy it and they sell it to the guy in Asia. And the central bank can still say they own it because they have one line in their statements and gold and gold receivables. So you don't know how much is physical and how much is leased out. And that's when I say suppressed, I think it's the leasing activity that keeps the, the fact that demand is in excess of supply from manifesting itself in the gold market. But we can take it from a supply demand, but also the outflows of money out of the resource sector, because essentially the sector as a whole has failed. These geologists promoted all these things, these promoters came in, they've raised a whole bunch of money. Mm -hmm. They didn't find what they said they were going to find. When they put it into production, it didn't produce the way they said it was going to produce. So the big money said, I'm out of here. Yeah. They've left. Yeah. So the market's not going to come back until new money is coming in. It just can't magically right. increase. Right. So where do you see that money coming in? And more importantly, the new generation, sure. like my generation, the yeah. digital generation, yeah. isn't thinking hard yeah. assets. Yeah. Because they're more in debt yeah. than any generation in the past. Yeah. Starting with school, they're, before they even graduate, they're $100,000 in debt. So I look at it as, yes, you're right. King, uh, gold is the currency of king, silver is the currency of gentlemen. 100% mm -hmm. correct. But barter is the currency of peasants and debt is the currency of slaves. With the whole anti-1% movement, considering mm -hmm. gold and silver is that 1%, mm -hmm. how are we going to attract sure. the new inflows of money? Sure. Well, you know, Mary, it's a great question. And I can imagine that people are very skeptical of all that's gone on uh, because we had such a run, right? I mean, the price of gold went from 250 to 1920, went up 700%. The stocks went up, uh, oh, they went up almost 1700%. <laughs> from the low, from the dead low in 2000. I was involved then, so I'm quite familiar with it. And of course, when you have those kind of run-ups, you get some excesses, right? Because everyone thinks that this is going to be the next big one or whatever. But I, I can assure you and, and your subscribers that, for example, I'm going to China this weekend. And why am I going to China? Because we have a Chinese mining company who together with us are going to put money into precious metal stocks. And we hope to convince other investors in China to do that. I had a recent visit from some people from the Middle East who want to put money, and we're not talking small amounts of money here, we're talking big amounts of money, into the gold and precious metals area. Who look, you know, if you're in Saudi Arabia and you look at the US, and I say to you, as I say to anybody, the US is broke. That is so easy to figure out, that they cannot meet their obligations. I'm talking about the, the pension obligation, the healthcare obligation. There's no way they can meet those, okay? They're gonna fail on something. Now, if you're sitting in the, somewhere outside the Western Central Bank looking in, you see the printing of money, you see the zero interest rate, you know what? You conclude, I must run on something real. And I can, you can see it manifested. I, I see the interest we, from India, from Saudi Arabia, from China. My own interest, I mean, I'm literally pouring money on a relative basis into personal money now into gold and silver stocks because I believe that there is going to be, a sh there is a shortage. It just hasn't been able to manifest itself in the paper market, but I have no concern about there being a shortage. So I think, you know, it'll all change. Um, the money will come back quickly, particularly if on the other side of the equation, let's say the economy gets kind of punk here because interest rates are going up. The cost of buying, the cost of someone buying a house in the States today versus a year ago, his monthly tab is up 50% in the last year because of interest rates and the cost of the house. But you got to know that that's going to slow the housing market down. The auto market should slow down. Even the government deficit, if rates keep going up here, it starts going up. But the U.S. markets are rocking. Yeah, it, 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 you know, they are I, I, I got my generation growing. What the yeah. hell are you wasting your time in, in mining? Uh, one of well, our neighbors is, is an internet entrepreneur. Yeah making yeah. millions yeah. and go, Marin, what's yeah. your CapEx? You know what my CapEx is? Yeah. This laptop. Yeah. They think that I'm a, a, right. a relic from the past. Yeah. But Mary, you know, it's funny, you're wasting your time in precious metals. Believe me, I didn't waste my time in precious metals, okay? <laughs> precious metal stocks went up 1,700%. So that was hardly a waste of time. While NASDAQ did nothing I might add for that whole 10 years, okay? In fact, NASDAQ is probably still Good down point. 50% even with your guy with the laptop. Um, so on a relative basis, I think 
gold was the better place to be. But if, and if people think that you know, everything's wonderful, I mean, you can read the statements of people in the tech industry. The tech industry's sales were down in the quarter, the earnings were down in the quarter, the outlooks are down. The economies in the world are going nowhere and being supported by the money printing. What if they weren't being supported by money printing? Where would we be today? I think. So, but why are they not taking a small percentage of those massive gains they've recently had in the tech sector or the biotech or anywhere and start bringing it yeah. into our sector? Because yeah. our sector is so small, yeah, yeah. such a niche market. Yeah. It's it's one percent of the oil market. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, it could easily happen, but it, it will start with certain factions who take a longer term point of view. You have to take a long-term point of view. In fact, one of the disappointments I've had is there's been very little action on the M&A side in the precious metals recently, right? You'd think maybe some of the larger companies, although most of them are, feel so burned by the previous acquisitions, are afraid to act, but you would think as they looked at the relative value of some stocks out there, that they might be a little more active. Uh, as I mentioned, I bought, I bought a gold stock, who's a producer, the other day, at 2.5% of its four-year high. It's producing more gold today than it was back then. I, I, could, I could hardly believe it. Um, What's going to be the game changer event? Is it going to be It's the price of gold. It has to be the price of gold. Is that going to be affected by, let's say, something developing in the Middle East? Uh, What's the trigger? Yeah, I don't use the Middle East or politi geopolitical things typically, as, as some reason to own it. Um, well, as I say, I think it's the physical. It's the physical buying. I mean, I'm stunned by the buying in China. China bought 60% of mine production last month. 60. That leaves you and I and the rest of the world to buy 40. If we let the Indians do what they did, they would have bought 62. But now we've got 120% of it and no one else is in there. I mean, I swear, these central planners have got that guy in India by the throat and said, with all the buying that those Chinese are doing, you better make sure you guys buy nothing. And he's very much attempted to have them buy nothing, literally nothing except what's smuggled, which we'll never see the data, so. So you're bullish on gold, you're bullish yeah. on silver, you're bullish on the equities, you're also bullish on farming. And one of the questions we had from our subscribers regarding Sprott Resource Corp, which yeah. as a firm we did follow, yeah. we made money on it. Yeah. I went through the MDNA and at the Casey Brain Trust, I, I noted that, I think it was on page 29 or 32, somewhere way in the back, it yeah. talked about the leases of the farms. Yes. And the lease was between <laughs> one and seven years for a farm. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not a farmer, right. but my family in the background were fa farmers. And one thing I did understand was, if you're building the infrastructure and building up a farm, yeah. I don't know about these short time leases. Sure, yeah. And the question was, is, is this a modern serfdom? Is this, what, what, what's going on here? Well, I'm not an expert on our farm business, okay? Because I'm not actively involved in spot resources. But I suspect that these are leases from the First Nations, right? And I would imagine anybody who's, who owns the rights to a piece of property would be very cautious about leasing it out for a long time, as maybe even we are, as a firm, cautious about leasing it out for a long time because nobody knows what's going to happen. So I really can't comment on the length of the leases and whether they're appropriate. Now, I don't, I look, I'm not even experienced enough in the agricultural to business, business to know what's normal. As you know, Kevin Bambro and his team run that. I don't have an active hand in it, so I'm really not <clears throat> the right person for this very tough and question. Tough, Kevin's had some <coughs> great successes mm -hmm. in that sector with the potash and the right. eggs. And he yeah. was on our KC Next 10 list, and then fortunately he got over 40 because the list only keeps people <laughs> under 40. So this has been great. Um, I thank you for answering the tough questions that the, our subscribers okay. want to know. And I look forward to seeing you at the Tucson, Arizona KC conference. And I look forward to more tough questions too. All right. Okay, Mary. Thank you. All the best.